Hello YouTube! In this video I'm going to introduce the problem of the criterion, a central problem in epistemology. Uh, the problem of the criterion can be stated by asking two questions, uh, and, and this problem can be phrased in different ways, but uh, probably the most general way to state it is like this. Question one, which propositions are true? And question two, what are the criteria for determining which propositions are true? How can we tell which propositions are true? So whenever we start engaging in any kind of inquiry, we can ask these two questions. So we can ask which propositions are true and what are the criteria for determining which propositions are true? Now, it seems that if we can answer one of these questions, then this is going to give us a way to answer the other. So suppose, for instance, that we answer the first question. We're able to say which propositions are true. So we can specify at least some true propositions. We can you know, pick out some, tr some propositions that are true and some that are not. Well, on that basis, we may be able to formulate criteria for truth that will allow us to determine, when engaging in further inquiries, which other propositions are true. So um, suppose, it, suppose I take it that you know, P1, P2, P3, etc. Are, are all true. Well, then I can look at what those propositions have in common and I can devise criteria for truth on that basis. So maybe I find that these propositions are connected to my sensory data in some way. Um, so in that case, I might propose that at least one criteria for determining which propositions are true is to look at which propositions can be derived from sensory data. Um, alternatively, suppose that I have an answer to the second question. Um, where, you know, this is the question, what are the criteria for determining which propositions are true? Well, in that case, I can fairly straightforwardly determine, when engaging in any inquiry, which propositions are true and which are not. So if I have an answer to the second question, I can get that, I can get an answer to the first. Um, so if I already know that sensory perception is a reliable guide to which propositions are true, then I can look at which propositions can be based on my sensory data and I just take those to be the true propositions. But the problem is that if I don't have an answer to the first question, then it seems that I have no way to answer the second. If I don't have any idea which propositions are true, then I'm not gonna have any way to figure out what the criteria are for determining truth and falsehood. Uh, because the question is like, uh, like, what features are indicative of truth? And without a list of true propositions and false propositions, it looks like there's just no way here to make any kind of judgment. And then similarly, if I don't have an answer to the second question, it seems that I have no way to answer the first. Because in order to determine which propositions are true, in order to answer that first question, it looks like I need a criterion for distinguishing the true propositions from the false ones. So here is my problem. Uh, without an answer to the first question, I can't answer the second, and without an answer to the second question, I can't answer the first. But then it looks like there's just no way for any inquiry to even get started. Uh, Andrew Kling, in his article Posing the Problem of the Criterion, summarises the difficulty this way. Uh, I quote, Short of lucky guessing, it seems that the only way to have good beliefs is to employ a criterion of truth whose goodness is somehow settled independently of the beliefs it warrants to be true. Yet it also seems that, again short of lucky guessing, in order to have a good criterion of truth, we must select from among alleged, alleged criteria of truth on the basis of independently good beliefs. So uh, that's the general problem of the criterion. Now, this problem has a very long history but it was reintroduced in, into contemporary philosophy by Roderick Chisholm. Uh, Chisholm says that there are three responses to this problem, but unfortunately, each of these responses begs the question against the other. So let's uh, look at the three responses. First of all, there is particularism. The particularist assumes an answer to the first question and then uses it to answer the second. So, uh, so the particularist starts with some set of propositions that she takes to be true. So she'll just take it that, you know, P, P1, P2, P3, etc. are true. And then no further, no further reason for their truth can be given. So I might just take it to be true that, for example, I have hands. 
that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, that 1 plus 1 equals 2, that torturing children is wrong, and so on. From this set of true propositions, the particularist can then propose a criterion for distinguishing true propositions from false ones. So the particularist is assuming various beliefs. She's assuming an answer to the first question, and then she can like come up with uh, criteria that she can apply uh, in, you know, to those propositions that she's currently undecided about. Second, there is methodism. The Methodist assumes an answer to the second question and then uses this to answer the first question. So the Methodist starts with C, where C is a criterion for determining which propositions are true. And no further reason for assuming C is given. Or no, no further reason for assuming that C is reliable is given. So suppose, for instance, that I accept a kind of traditional empiricism, which says that all knowledge is derivable from sense experience. So we're, we're justified in taking a proposition to be true only if that proposition satisfies certain empirical criteria. Um, well, a Methodist who is attracted to empiricism will just assume this criterion and then apply it to various propositions. And in this way, she will sort the you know, justified propositions from the unjustified ones. So propositions such as I have hands and the sun rises in the east and sets in the west turn out to be justified because they can be grounded in sensory experience. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, a proposition like torturing children is wrong, well, maybe that's not justified because moral properties such as wrongness are not found in sensory experience. Or so the argument might go. Um, that's just an example. Uh, th so th the point is, you know, I mean, like, obviously the Methodist might Yes, the Methodist might propose various other criteria. You know, there might be several sort of sources of knowledge, maybe not just perception, but memory, intuition, reason, divine revelation, right? Whatever you like. The point is a Methodist is going to begin with some criterion for sorting the true propositions from the false ones. She then applies that criterion to determine what she should believe. So she assumes the reliability of some criterion. And then with that, she uses that to answer the first question, the question, which propositions are true? Third, there is scepticism. The skeptic says that we can't answer the first question until we answer the second, and we can't answer the second question until we answer the first. So we have no answer to either. And that means that all of our knowledge is going to be undermined. We can never know what propositions are true and we don't have any means for determining what propositions are true. Uh, again, Andrew Kling frames the sceptical argument as follows. Premise one, good beliefs depend upon an independently good criterion of truth. So we, ha we can have no independently good beliefs. Um, premise two, a good criterion of truth depends upon independently good beliefs. Uh, so we can have no independently good criterion of truth. And then the first conclusion from that is, well, we can have no good beliefs. And the second conclusion is we can have no good criterion of truth. So that's the case for scepticism, that there's just, you know, well, yeah, we have no idea what propositions are true. We have uh, no idea what criteria for sorting the true propositions from the false ones are reliable. Um, we have no knowledge. Now, each of these responses involves making a kind of ungrounded assumption. And Chisholm says that as such, each of them begs the question against the other. So let's see how this works. Um, so take the particularist. The particularist simply presupposes that she can select various true propositions. But it seems that this begs the question against Methodism and scepticism. Methodists and skeptics deny that we have an independent answer to question one. Now, if we ask the particularist for a justification for her starting point, right, for, you know, her answer to question one, well, all the particularist can do is appeal to propositions that she has assumed without further reason. All the particularist can do is just assume an answer to question one. Um, you know, the, the Methodist and skeptic say that it's illegitimate to start in this way, that it's illegitimate to start by assuming that a certain set of propositions are true. What reasons can the particularist offer for starting with her particular propositions? Well, ultimately, she can only offer 
those very propositions, um, or perhaps other propositions that have been derived from those propositions. But ultimately, the justification is going to um, begin with those very propositions, the ones that she has just assumed from the outset. So it seems that this begs the question against the Methodist and the skeptic. Similarly, let's take Methodism. The Methodist presupposes that she has a criterion of truth. Um, now, particularists and skeptics deny this. Particularists and skeptics deny that we, we have an independent answer to question two. And if we ask the Methodist for a justification for this criterion, the Methodist can only appeal to propositions that have been selected by that criterion itself. Uh, so the Methodist is assuming is, is just assuming an answer to the second question. Um, the particularist and the skeptic say that it's illegitimate to start in this way. What reasons can the Methodist offer for starting in this way? Well, again, she can only offer propositions that are judged legitimate by the criterion that she has just started with, and that both the particularist and the skeptic are going to take to be illegitimate. So Methodism seems to beg the question against particularism and scepticism. Scepticism also begs the question, because scepticism assumes that if there is no answer to one, then there is no answer to two, and that if there is no answer to two, then there is no answer to one. But of course, the skeptic has no further reason for these claims. If asked for a justification for these propositions, there is nothing the skeptic can say. Uh, she can't appeal to other propositions. Indeed, as a skeptic, she doesn't endorse any other propositions. Um, if she were to make an appeal to other propositions, then these propositions would either be assumed without further reason, making her a particularist, or they would be selected by some criterion that is assumed without further reason, making her a Methodist. So, I mean, again, the skeptic is just making unfounded assumptions here, just like the particularist and the Methodist. Indeed, it might actually seem that skepticism is in some ways like a, a kind of particularism, because the skeptic affirms the conditional propositions that first, if there is no answer to question one, there is no answer to question two. And second, if there is no answer to question two, there is no answer to question one. Uh, and she also affirms that these entail that neither question can be answered and that this undermines our knowledge. So it kind of looks as if the skeptic is actually starting with a set of propositions that she simply assumes, just like the particularist does. Um, so in any case, um, what we seem to be left with here is three positions, or maybe just two positions, that each involve starting with completely ungrounded assumptions, uh, assumptions which are rejected by the opponent positions. So it, we end up with these sort of three positions that just, like, each just begs the question against the other one. Now, Chisholm says that there are three responses to the problem of the criterion, particularism, methodism, and scepticism. But is this right? Well, a first point here is that what Chisholm calls scepticism arguably conflates two responses. So as Chisholm described it, the skeptic affirms that we cannot answer either question, and so you know this undermines all our knowledge. Um, but at this point, it's worth drawing a distinction between two different kinds of skepticism. So drawing on discussions of ancient skepticism, we might call these different kinds of skepticism academic scepticism and Peronian scepticism. Academic scepticism affirms that there is no justification for any of our beliefs, that knowledge is impossible. Peronian scepticism, by contrast, simply suspends judgment. The Peronian skeptic holds no belief about whether there is justification or whether we have knowledge. The Peronian skeptic neither asserts nor denies any proposition. Now, what Chisholm is calling scepticism is clearly academic scepticism. The academic skeptic says we can't answer either question, so we have no justification uh, and no knowledge. The Peronian skeptic, by contrast, is just going to suspend judgment on whether we can answer either question. And she's just going to suspend judgment on whether we have justification or knowledge. Um, so the Peronian skeptic will neither assert nor deny anything about how, if at all, those two questions might be answered. So this does seem to be a fourth possible you know, view we might take. Um, particularism, methodism, and academic skepticism all involve endorsing some proposition 
concerning the right solution to the problem of the criterion. The Peronian skeptic has no solution. Um, moreover, while uh, so particularism, Methodism, and, and academic skepticism all propose a solution on the basis of ungrounded assumptions, it seems that the Peronian, at least, is not committed to any ungrounded assumptions because the Peronian doesn't make any assumptions at all. The Peronian it doesn't have any beliefs whatsoever. Um, so there does, so yeah, arguably there does seem to be a relevant difference here, and so we might think that actually there is a fourth option. Um, it's worth noting as well, I mean, one reason why we might prefer uh, the Peronian response to the uh, academic skeptic response is that arguably academic skepticism is self-defeating. Uh, the academic skeptic says that we cannot answer either question and concludes from this that we have no knowledge, we have no way to know which propositions are true. Yet at the same time, the academic skeptic endorses the conditional propositions the proposition that if there is no answer to one, there is no answer to two, and the proposition that if there is no answer to two, there is no answer to one. Uh, the academic skeptic has to endorse these propositions in order to reach her conclusion that we have no knowledge. Yet endorsing these propositions obviously conflicts with her claim that we cannot know any propositions. Um, I mean, moreover, we can ask like, okay, what is the status of the very proposition that we cannot know any propositions? Uh, in order to be an academic skeptic, at least as we have defined the view here, it seems that you must endorse a proposition, namely the proposition that we cannot know any propositions. But by endorsing that very proposition, you're saying that you don't know the proposition. Uh, and that seems at least self-undermining. Um, since Peronian skeptics do not endorse any propositions, it doesn't seem to be self-undermining, at least in that kind of way. So. Uh, that's just one reason for taking Peronian scepticism seriously as uh, an alternative response. Okay, so the next question is whether there are any non-sceptical responses beyond particularism and Methodism. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> uh, it's not going to be much comfort to most philosophers if they're told that uh, they could they could just as well adopt Peronian scepticism. Most philosophers don't want to accept uh, any kind of scepticism, um, at least not, you know, scepticism so uh, so global and so radical. Um, so are there any uh, alternative non-sceptical responses? Um, we've seen that both particularism and methodism rest on ungrounded assumptions and each begs the question against the other position. Uh, obviously that's a, an unwelcome state of affairs, so can we do better? Well, in fact, many philosophers hold that there are alternatives to particularism and methodism, and one popular option here is co coherentism. So the challenge posed by the problem of the criterion is that it looks like we can answer question one only if we first answer question two, and it looks like we can only answer question two only if we first answer question one. So then it seems like we can't answer either question. But then we might think, well, couldn't we proceed by answering both questions at the same time? Like, couldn't we tackle them simultaneously? And this is basically the solution offered by coherentism. So the particularist is going to assume an answer to question one, right? The particularist takes it that there are certain particular beliefs that are epistemically prior to criteria. So the beliefs come first, right? And then we use that to figure out the criteria. Methodism assumes an answer to question two. The Methodist holds that the criteria for sorting beliefs are epistemically prior to the beliefs themselves, right? We start with a criterion for sorting beliefs into the true and the false, and we, we use that to then answer the first question. Coherentists are going to reject these claims of epistemic priority. Essentially, the coherentist says that we must balance our beliefs against our criteria for truth until both the beliefs and the criteria form a coherent, harmonious, self-supporting system. We must bring our beliefs about what is true and our criteria for what is true into uh, reflective equilibrium, uh, to use the technical phrase. So here's uh, how this works. In practice, we're going to start any inquiry with a set of particular judgments, a set of beliefs, intuitions, perceptions, memories, and so on. Um, and we also start with various principles for belief formation. 
So, um, you know, when I sort of set out in some inquiry about things in the world, an initial belief might be something such as I have hands. And then an initial criterion of belief formation might be something like trust perception. Okay. So then as my inquiry proceeds, I'm then going to make revisions to my set of beliefs and these criteria in order to increase the overall coherence among them. So both the initial propositions that I take to be true and the initial criteria for determining which propositions are true are adjusted until maximum coherence is reached. I mean, in practice, this project is going to continue indefinitely as more data come in. Um, but th so the point is then we're actually answering both questions simultaneously. We start with an initial set of propositions and an initial set of criteria, and then these are both revisable. And yeah, like we, we, we tackle both questions at once. So maybe uh, let's think of a, a more specific example of this. Suppose that I'm walking in a desert and I see a reflective blue surface in the distance. I form the belief that there is a lake ahead of me. Uh, in this case, my criteria of belief formation is something such as trust perception. Okay, perception seems to reveal a lake. I just trust it and I believe that there's a lake in front of me. But, you know, then I can test these beliefs against other beliefs that I hold. Um, and I notice in this case, my spontaneous belief that there is a lake ahead of me doesn't fit smoothly with my background knowledge of deserts. Right? I know that deserts are uh, hot, dry environments where lakes are unlikely to be found. Um, so I think, OK, well, I, either there's no water ahead of me and the appearance is illusory or there's something that makes this particular place special. Um, and then, you know, maybe I, I might gain more data. I gather more data. I might walk to where the lake appeared to be and I find that now there only appears to be sand. So my initial belief that there was a lake ahead of me, that doesn't fit smoothly with my belief that only a short time after apparently seeing the lake, there's only sand. Um, so because now it's like, well, either there never was any water there and the initial appearance was illusory or there's something special about this place that made the water disappear quickly. But there doesn't seem to be anything that makes this place special. So like I start by initially trusting perception, you know, because I take perception to be a sort of window into the world. But then I find that there are various contexts where perception is misleading. You know, so like I seem to perceive a lake in the distance, but then I find uh, it's, it's, it seems to, you know, it, it provides a sort of more s smoother uh, system to say that there is no lake, that the appearance was illusory. Um, and I can appeal to other beliefs that I have, beliefs about the behaviour of light in hot environments and how hot air causes light to refract. And this explains the illusory appearance. So, you know, I, I no longer simply trust perception. I've, I've given up my initial belief that there was a lake ahead of me and I've revised the criterion trust perception. But, but notice that um, this same process which explains the illusory appearance, so um, the behaviour of light in particular environments, that same process also explains why my perception is reliable at other times. The interaction of light with the environment of the desert explains why I correctly perceive sand dunes that are located close to me. Um, so like okay, I, my initial belief, there is a lake ahead of me, that has been revised. The initial criterion, trust perception, that has been revised. I now believe that what looks like a lake is a mirage, and my criterion now specifies circumstances in which perception is reliable and circumstances in which it's misleading. When I'm in hot environments, perception delivers a reliable picture of objects located close to me, but illusions occur with objects that appear in the distance. And what I've done here is, my beliefs now are not just consistent. I have kind of explanatory connections between them. Like, you know, again, I can I can explain why perception is reliable uh, in the case of objects that are located close to me. I can explain why perception is illusory for objects that are apparently located in the distance. Um, so in this so in this kind of way, you know, and by making further adjustments to my beliefs and my criteria, I can build up a coherent system. Now this example is obviously simplified but it illustrates the general idea. As the coherentist sees it, what the problem of the criterion shows is simply that we, we can't start from nowhere. We start with whatever beliefs and criteria for belief formation we initially find ourselves with. 
but then we revise each of these in light of new data, weighing each of them against the other until we have a coherent explanatory system. And, you know, so justification and knowledge, this consists precisely in the interdependence of belief and criteria for belief. So the, the coherentist denies that in order to know what is true, we must have an independent criterion for truth. And she denies that in order to have a criterion for truth, we must independently know what is true. Um, she takes it that, that our two questions are answered simultaneously. Now, there's a fairly obvious objection to all of this. Coherentism is presented as an alternative to particularism and methodism, but we might think, isn't this just a form of methodism? Uh, so, so the thought is that the criterion for belief in this case is just going to be something like uh, coherence of beliefs and criteria for belief, right? So the coherentist is just assuming an answer to question two, right? Where uh, the coherentist is, is assuming an answer to the question, right, what are the criteria for determining which propositions are true? And the criteria that she's assuming is coherence of beliefs and criteria for belief. Uh, now, it, you know, obviously this is, you know, there's, there's a sort of slight snag here because w in this case we have beliefs and specific criteria for forming beliefs. And both of these are revisable, right? So we revise beliefs and we can revise specific criteria for forming beliefs. So a criteria such as trust perception, that can be revised. But then there's a higher level criterion which governs how those beliefs and criteria are to be adjusted. The higher level criterion is coherence. So the coherentist, like the Methodist, uh, seems to be assuming an answer to question two, right? Coherence is the criterion. And notice uh, that there are other properties that we could adopt as this sort of higher level criterion instead. We could aim for a maximally incoherent system of beliefs and criteria for beliefs. We could aim for a set of beliefs that is inconsistent, that fail to explain each other, that do not fit together harmoniously. I mean, you know, we like, yeah, that's in principle something that a human being could do, right? They could adopt that as their higher level criterion, and then they could adjust their beliefs and criteria for belief uh, with the goal of generating incoherence. Um, alternatively, we could aim for the most aesthetically pleasing system of beliefs and criteria for beliefs, where uh, aesthetic norms might involve some degree of coherence. I mean, artworks can often be more aesthetically pleasing when they involve some uh, chaos and disorder. Uh, uh, so at, at the very least, like these look like they are alternative criteria for uh, assessing beliefs and specific criteria, right? Like they, they, these provide alternative ways of weighing up the initial beliefs against the initial criteria for beliefs. So in selecting co coherence, we are simply assuming a higher level criterion. Um, and, you know, again, although the, uh, so although on the coherentist view, specific criteria for belief formation are open to revision, this higher level criterion of coherence is fixed. The coherentist will select criteria for belief formation on the basis of which of those are taken to promote overall coherence. But the higher level criterion of overall coherence, that's not something that can be revised. Uh, be, like this is, the, this is the criterion by which all revisions are judged. So from the coherentist point of view, it might be reasonable to give up the criteria trust perception, but it's never going to be reasonable to give up the higher level criterion of maximize coherence. To give up the higher level criterion of coherence would just be to stop being a coherentist. Um, so the coherentist assumes a fixed criterion prior to inquiry that they use to judge beliefs. And that looks like they're assuming an answer to the second question, which would make them a Methodist. Um, a further objection here is that even if uh, coherentism is uh, something separate from Methodism. Um, the charge is that actually coherentism also begs the question. So the coherentist is going to accept, just like the academic skeptic, that um, we can't answer the first question without an answer to the second, and we can't answer the second question without an answer to the first. Um, 
of course, unlike the academic skeptic, the coherentist denies that um, failing to answer these questions independently means that they can't be answered at all because uh, the coherentist thinks they can be answered simultaneously. But um, but the point is, the coherentist is going to say, well, yeah, we can't answer the, that first question without an answer to the second. We can't answer the second without an answer to the first. But now the worry is that this just begs the question against particularism and methodism. Um, the coherentist is starting with the assumption that there is no independent answer to questions one and two. The particularist says there is an independent answer to question one. The methodist says there is an independent answer to question two. So there's a disagreement here. If we ask the coherentist to justify her claim that there is no independent answer to question one and two, she can only appeal to beliefs and criteria for belief formation that are both interdependent. She can only appeal to beliefs and criteria for belief formation that she takes to be justified by virtue of their being part of a coherent system that answers one and two simultaneously. But this is just what the, you know, the particularist and the Methodist will, will object that this is illegitimate. Um, to, so for the coherentist to like present her beliefs as a justification is just to assume that particularism and Methodism are mistaken. Um, again, it looks like what we have is just a conflict of unfounded assumptions. So um, that's that's coherentism again. That's that's uh, one of the more popular alternatives. There are many um, other views that have been proposed as alternatives to particularism and Methodism, um, but again, you know, similar problems, similar objections tend to be tend to arise um, for those views as well. Um, of course. Uh, in presenting these as problems for coherentism, um, I'm only uh, presenting this in the context of the problem of the criterion. Um, so coherentism may have, you know, plenty of uh, benefits in other ways, um, but it's not obvious that it is successful as a response to the problem of the criterion. Um, there are lots of other contexts in which philosophers have defended coherentist views. Uh, it's worth just uh, making a note of that. Um, okay, so finally I want to address the scope of the problem of the criterion. Traditionally the problem of the criterion is presented as arising at the beginning of inquiry. Uh, it may be difficult to answer, uh, it's not satisfying that all the responses seem to rest on unfounded assumptions, but the hope is that once we have an answer to the problem of the criterion, inquiry can proceed smoothly, you know, we can just build up our knowledge uh, without worrying about it. There is, however, the concern that the problem of the criterion never really goes away, that it continues to arise in later stages of inquiry, that there will always be a further problem of the criterion. So let's see how this might work. Suppose, for example, that, um, that we accept something like traditional empiricism. So we're going to say that all knowledge is derived from sense experience. Um, now, maybe we have inferred empiricism from particular propositions that we endorse, so we give a particularist answer to the problem of the criterion, or maybe we take empiricism as a fixed criterion for assessing beliefs, so we give a Methodist answer to the problem of the criterion. Um, well, you know, whether we go for particularism or Methodism, it, it looks like, okay, we endorse empiricism, now we are free to construct the rest of our knowledge, right? We're, we're, we're free to sort of engage in inquiry and figure out the way the world is and what the facts are and so on. We look to sensory experience. But now consider this pair of questions. Question one, what things count as sensory experience? Question two, what is the criterion for whether or not something is sensory experience? Now it seems that if we don't have an answer to the first question, we can't answer the second. If we don't have any idea what counts as sensory experience, then we won't have any way to figure out what the criteria are for distinguishing sensory experience from other states. But then if we don't have an answer to the second question, it seems we can't answer the first. In order to determine what counts as sensory experience, we need a criterion for distinguishing sensory experience from other things. Now this is not an idle problem, because, like, you know, just think of the question, okay, how do we classify, for instance, intuitions, dreams, mental imagery, after images, emotions, memories, hungers, itches, pains? Uh, there's, there's this whole 
you know, that there's this enormous variety of kind of mental items where it's really not obvious what, like, what, what an empiricist should say about them. And, and just consider the many different theoretical accounts of sensory perception that have been developed historically. Um, there is, in practice, a great deal of debate about the nature and scope of sensory experience. So even after we say that knowledge is derived from sensory experience, we face a problem of the criterion concerning what sensory experience is. Right, so even, even if we can say that knowledge is derived from experience, it looks like we're not really any closer to um, getting justified beliefs about the world, because we now, we now have this second problem of the criterion concerning the identification of sensory experience. Okay, suppose we have an answer to this question. Well, now consider the questions. Question one. What propositions are justified by sensory experience? Question two. What is the criterion for whether or not a proposition is justified by sensory experience? Uh, this is probably ev even more controversial than the characterization of sensory experience. So what exactly is it for sensory experience to justify a proposition? Notice that there are, there are all sorts of lines we could take here. We could say that a proposition is justified by sensory experience only if that proposition could not possibly be false, given the experience. So, you know, like a, like a particular experience just kind of rules out everything except that proposition. Um, on, on this kind of view, it's going to turn out that we have very little knowledge, that there are very few propositions that are justified, because, you know, a proposition such as I have hands, well, actually, that could be false, given my experiences. Um, you know, if I were a brain in a vat, or if I were being deceived by an evil demon, or if I'm dreaming right now, you know, I'm, I could have exactly the same experiences that I'm having right now, but I wouldn't, you know, it would be false that I have hands. Um, so, you know, an alternative view is that, is we might say, well, you know, a proposition is justified by some experience if the proposition is made probable by the experience. Uh, of course, this requires us to give some account of probability, you know, but okay, like the proposition is made probable by the experience per this account of probability. Or we might say um, that a, a proposition is justified by some experience if the proposition provides the best explanation of the, appear of, of the experience. And then again, you know, we're going to need some account of um, what an explanation is and, uh, you know, inference, the best explanation and so on. Um, and, but, you know, again, like, whatever we say here, we're going to run into this problem of the criterion, that if we don't have any idea what propositions are justified by experience, we won't be able to figure out the criteria for determining whether or not a proposition is justified by experience. And if we don't have any criteria for determining whether or not a proposition is justified by experience, we won't be able to judge which propositions are justified by experience. Um, so, you know, like, we're now running into the problem of the criterion again. And notice, incidentally, that, um, you know, we, we actually... Re so, I, I've just given here three very brief accounts of what it means to say that a proposition is justified by experience. And it should be fairly easy to see how you can state a problem of the criterion for every single one of those, right? It's fairly easy to state a problem of the criterion for this notion of, uh, of you know, an experience ruling out everything except a, a proposition. So, like, when we say... P could not possibly be false, given the experience. What does it mean? Like, what, did, what does that mean, could not possibly be false? Similarly, for probability, similarly for explanation, um, you can state uh, problems of the criterion for all of those. Um, and so, I mean, look, I focused on traditional empiricism here, but it, hopefully you can see that it's, it's actually fairly easy to generate uh, these two questions the, these problems of the criterion for any belief system you like, right? It's not difficult to come up with these two questions for basically any belief system at all. Um, so we see then that there's not one problem of the criterion, there are many problems of the criterion. And it may be that this problem will just keep re-arising at every stage of the inquiry. So, I mean, this is why the problem is so challenging. The worry is not simply that we have to make an unfounded assumption at the beginning of inquiry, it's that the whole process of inquiry is just going to involve unfounded assumptions piled upon unfounded assumptions as this problem arises over and over and over and over again. And I am going to 
leave this video with that. Uh, that, is, that is the end of that video. I hope you found it interesting. Um, goodbye. Thanks for watching.